Today at the National Press Club, Chair of the Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide, Nick Caldas. The former high-ranking New South Wales police officer has worked for the United Nations and is now touring the country investigating Australia's treatment of soldiers and their mental health. Nick Caldas, today at the National Press Club. Hello and welcome to today's National Press Club Westpac Address. My name is Andrew Tillett and I'm the club's Vice President as well as the uh, Defence and Foreign Affairs Correspondent for the Australian Financial Review. Regular viewers will notice today's address is in a different venue. The Press Club is currently undergoing renovation, so we're broadcasting from the National Gall Gallery of Australia's Gandal Hall. Today's speaker is Nick Caldas, Chair of the Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide. Mr Caldas, one of the top investigators of his generation and a former Deputy Commissioner of the New South Wales Police, was appointed to head the Royal Commission in 2021 following alarming support, uh, reports of the suicide crisis among military personnel and veterans. Mr Caldas and his fellow Royal Commissioners have taken evidence from hundreds of witnesses and thousands of submissions from current and former servicemen and women about mistreatment while serving in uniform and struggles after leaving the military with physical and mental health. An interim report last year made 11 recommend, 13 recommendations, including the need to reduce the backlog of claims for help from the Department of Veterans Affairs. With the final report due next year, Mr Caldas last week issued a rebuke of the defence leadership saying they wanted the Royal Commission to end so they could go back to business as usual. For current and former personnel and their families, a reminder that assistance is available from the Open Arms Counselling Service on 1800 011 046 or Lifeline on 131114. You can follow today's conversation at Press Club Ost or hashtag MPC. Please everyone welcome Nick Caldas. Thanks very much, Andy. Good afternoon, ladies and gents. Um, it's an honour to be here today during Suicide Prevention Week to speak about what is a national tragedy and unacceptably high rates of suicide and suicidality among serving and ex-serving members of the Australian Defence Force. Um, and the future, and the failure rather, by successive governments, the ADF and the Departments of Defence and Veteran Affairs to adequately protect the mental health and wellbeing of those who serve our country. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, the Ngunnawal people, and we pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and extend that respect to any other First Nations people who are here today or watching us across Australia. On behalf of my fellow commissioners, Dr Peggy Brown, AO, and the Honourable James Douglas, KC, I would also like to acknowledge and thank current and former members of the Australian Defence Force and their families for the unique and important sacrifices that they have made on behalf of our country. I would also like to acknowledge the senior leadership from the ADF and other Commonwealth agencies for joining us here today. This Royal Commission recognises that every death by suicide is a tragic event and that there is an over-representation of defence and veteran deaths by suicide in this country. We acknowledge all of those who have a lived experience of suicide and we acknowledge the lives lost. We acknowledge those who have made an attempt on their life and those who are vulnerable to suicide. And we acknowledge those bereaved by suicide, the families, friends, colleagues and supporters of those who died. I want to start today by taking you back to Australia's very first Royal Commission. The SS Drayton Grange was a British merchant vessel chartered to transport 1,500 Australian soldiers returning home from the Boer War in South Africa in July in 1902. Considerable overcrowding and unsanitary conditions compounded by a lack of adequate medical supplies and poor weather led to outbreaks of measles and influenza, influenza as well as lice infestation. By this time, the troop ship had docked in Melbourne at the end of its month-long voyage. Five soldiers were dead and another 12 died in the weeks that followed. Public outrage led to the Royal Commission's Act being enacted in August of 1902 
and within days Australia's very first Royal Commission into the Great and Drayton Grange was underway. It ultimately found the officer commanding the troops wanted to do the best in a trying position. But the best seemed to be accepting things as they were rather than making strenuous efforts to improve them, to endure rather than to overcome. One might draw parallels between this dark chapter in our military history and the current tragedy at the core of this Royal Commission. The Royal Commission on the Defence and Veteran Suicide was established in 2021 after the then Prime Minister Morrison bowed to political pressure from cross-party MPs and senators. That followed a hard-fought and sustained campaign by the brave families of Australian veterans who had taken their own lives, as well as former ADF members who were traumatised in various ways. The numbers are heartbreaking. There were at least 1,600 deaths by suicide between 1997 and 2020 of veterans who served on or after the 1st of January 1985. That's more than 20 times the number killed in active duty over roughly the same period. It's important to stress that these numbers do not include serving and ex-serving members whose deaths were not officially recorded as suicide, such as incidents where intent could not be actually determined. Nor do they include those who had served before 1985, including our Vietnam veterans who died by suicide. Tragically, the senseless loss, senseless loss of life continues today. Rarely a week goes by that this Royal Commission isn't alerted to the untimely death of another serving or ex-serving member. It's unquestionably a national crisis. For every life lost, there are family, friends, colleagues and whole communities flooded by grief and anger. Researchers at the University of Kentucky in the United States have even put a number on it, finding that for every suicide, 135 people are impacted. This Royal Commission's terms of reference are deliberately broad, requiring us to look into the risk and protective factors in relation to all aspects of military life. This wide-ranging inquiry has now been running for about 26 months. During that time, we've been provided about 250,000 documents in response to more than 1,000 compulsory notices that we've issued. We've received approximately 4,200 public submissions and we've heard from more than 300 witnesses during 11 public hearing blocks in capital cities and garrison towns across Australia. We commissioners have held 535 private sessions or private hearings, if you like, sitting one-on-one -on -one with people with lived experience of suicide or suicidality or military service and hearing their deeply personal stories. And there are some 400 private sessions still to be undertaken throughout the rest of 2023 and 2024. The Commission has also visited close to two dozen defence bases across the country, hearing directly from current servicemen and women about the challenges and opportunities of life in our Navy, Army and Air Force. And we've worked closely with the academic and research community, veterans groups and charitable organisations, commissioning research and conducting workshops round and roundtables on a diverse range of issues. High rates of suicide and suicidality among serving and ex-serving military personnel are not problems exclusive to Australia. That's why, in line with our terms of reference, we commissioners have looked at how Australia's Five Eyes partners, Canada, New Zealand, the United Kingdom and the United States, are responding to similar challenges in their military communities. We have looked at what has and hasn't worked for our closest allies and what might work if applied in the Australian context. So with all this information, what have we learned so far? First and foremost, I want to take a moment to correct the common misconception that all veterans are broken. We know that is definitely not the case. The vast majority of those who serve in the ADF have rewarding careers and go on to successfully transition to civilian life. The extensive range of skills, abilities and attributes developed during the military service mean veterans are well regarded by the private sector, employers, across a diverse range of industries, particularly in a tight labour market such as we have at the moment. And many make a valuable contribution to their communities and broader society in their post-service life. Notably, this includes many who have suffered physical or mental health impacts during their service. Sadly though, this is not the case for all who serve. 
Some veterans struggle to find their post-service identity in the civilian world or to secure gainful employment. Some find it difficult to make meaningful connections in their new community while no longer enjoying the ease of contact with their former defence colleagues. And some suffer due to the permanent physical and mental health impacts from their service. All of the above can lead them to dark places in their mind, including to suicide and suicidal behaviour. We know that suicide in the military context is an extremely complex and multifaceted phenomenon. It's not just about mental health, although mental health issues do often do play a part. Nor, as is often assumed, is it always related to trauma experienced in the theatre of war, although this too can clearly play a role. It is not a reflection of the character of the individual or indicative of some inherent deficit in their psyche or their moral framework. And lastly, while suicide may not be predictable in every individual, it must be viewed as preventable. Individuals who suicide are quite often in contact with an agency or organisation prior to their death. We know the way in which agencies and organisations interact with veterans can and does impact their mental health and well-being. They, they, these organisations, therefore, have a responsibility to act in ways that are alert to the risks and that reflect appropriate support and compassion for individuals who may have experienced trauma and are vulnerable. As we have peeled back the layers of complexity, there's been much more to find that has been illuminating. Let me share some of that with you. We already know from existing Australian Institute of Health and Welfare data that the suicide rate for ex-serving males who served after 1985 and died between 1997 and 2020 was 27 per cent higher when compared with the general Australian population. And the suicide rate for ex-serving females was 107 per cent higher. Further analysis conducted by the AIHW at the request of this Royal Commission has been more telling. It found that suicide rates for ex-serving men who only served in the reserve forces is similar to the general Australian male population. But the suicide rate for ex-serving men who served in the permanent forces is actually 44 per cent higher than the general population, Australian general population. This differential is not seen in the suicide rates for ex-serving females. Significantly, whether women served in the reserves or permanent forces, their suicide rate is about twice that of the general Australian population, Australian female population. Defence tells us its selection process delivers a healthy worker effect because it excludes individuals who don't meet the necessary physical and mental health requirements. We also hear from Defence that its members have easy access, at least in theory, to free and ongoing health care, including mental health support, and to the ADF's suicide prevention program. We're charged with inquiring into the link between high rates of suicidality and permanent service in the Defence Force and evaluating the effectiveness of the health care and support provided by, members, by two members of the ADF. The fact that suicide rates for those who have served in the permanent forces are higher than the Australian population is worrying. To address this, Defence must first acknowledge its role and actively and urgently embrace the changes needed. The first step to fixing a problem is to acknowledge that a problem exists. Before moving on, I'd like to make an important point. To date, the analysis of suicide data in relation to serving ADF members has been limited. It has compared suicide rates among people in service to a limited metric, the general Australian population. Significantly, this metric includes employed and non-employed people. So we're currently examining a new methodology whereby we compare suicide rates for serving ADF members only with the employed population of Australia. This is a new way of looking at this data and we hope this will yield greater insights about whether or not service is actually a protective factor. Historically, there appears to have been a reluctance by defence to accept suicide, suicidality and mental health as a consequence of military service. Such issues were instead put down to a weakness in the individual's character or resilience, rather than something for which the military organisation must take some responsibility. Fifty years on from the end of Australia's involvement in the Vietnam War, I acknowledge the lasting legacy of our Vietnam veterans in being the first to raise awareness about mental health and PTSD. Their experiences have helped shape modern society's understanding of these incredibly complex issues 
which allows this Royal Commission to examine in depth the ongoing tragedy that, it, that is defence of veteran suicide. So what's going on? What is contributing to this increased suicide risk, particularly for those who have served in the permanent forces? We've looked at all aspects of service life in our quest for answers. We've examined Defence's recruitment practices, including whether its marketing campaigns create unrealistic expectations in new recruits. We've looked at training processes. We understand and accept their importance for building strength, resilience and ADF preparedness. But do they result in preventable career-ending injuries? We've explored the effect of postings and how the lives of partners and children are regularly uprooted with work, schooling, friendships and support systems cut off before they've been properly established and have to be established anew in their next location. We know some ADF members are required to deploy for months and at a time often at short notice, meaning long periods away from loved ones and sometimes they can't even tell their family where they're going for or for how long, causing immense distress. We know families play a vital role in members' wellbeing. Research shows ADF personnel perform better and serve longer when their families are happy, well and stable. During our Adelaide hearing, Commissioner Brown expressed her frustration at the amount of work Defence still needs to do in this vital area, particularly around childcare, domestic and family violence, improved communication and the need for better data co collection. The Supporting Service Families report was written by Sue Hamilton in 1986, identified many of these issues and here we are 37 years later and we continue to hear how many Defence families are still doing it tough. On the 15th of May this year, during National Families Week, the Minister of Veteran Affairs and Defence Personnel issued a media release in which he stated, and I quote, people are Defence's most important capability and we recognise the importance of supporting the families that support those who serve. Having the support of their family is essential for ADF members to undertake their work and service of our nation, while families are often on the front line when a veteran needs some extra support. End quote. Gwen Churn, the Veteran Family Advocate Commissioner, told us in evidence that families are being let down by a lack of investment from Defence and the DVA. We certainly heard Ms Churn's frustration as she told us, and I quote, until every part of this ecosystem of support that is supposed to exist for families starts recognising them, talking to them and actually investing in programs and support services for them, then it's just rhetoric and will continue to suffer and will continue to fray the fabric of Australian society." End quote. Families are under stress can break down. We know family breakdown can be and tragically has been associated with suicide. That is why it's vital that Defence and DVA step up to the plate when it comes to providing appropriate support for military families. When it comes to protecting the mental health and well-being of service men and women, the evidence this Royal Commission has uncovered to date suggests there's been far too much talk and not enough action. We know the Chief of Defence Force appointed a Brigadier, a one-star officer, to head up a new mental health and wellbeing branch within Defence. We note this initiative commenced two years after the establishment of the Royal Commission. From the evidence we heard in Perth, it seems that that senior officer has not been provided all the information, staff and resources required to appropriately address mental health and suicide prevention at an organisational level. We've been told there will be no mature, fully resourced and functioning branch until at least 2025. To quote the Brigadier, she said they are building the plane as they're flying it. Given that we've known these issues have existed since at least the Vietnam War, it seems extraordinary to hear that Defence is now building the plane. We note that Defence was able to stand up without delay a very well resourced task force led by a two star officer to assist this Royal Commission. Yet Defence's approach to investigating and reporting on suicides has progressed at a snail's pace. We are yet to find sufficient evidence of urgency in responding to these complex issues holistically, even with this Royal Commission on foot. We've heard about attempts by the Navy Clearance Divers Trust to offer data, expertise and advice on issues of mental health, safety and wellbeing. In evidence, the Trust told this Royal Commission that despite three suicides within their ranks over a two-year period, there was no response from Navy. We also heard about a key initiative shown to significantly reduce injury rates among military personnel and improve the reporting of injuries, having its funding withdrawn. 
All of this raises serious questions as to whether Defence is committed to making change in the best interests of its members or whether they're just going through the motions. We've heard contemporary lived experience accounts of abuse, assault, bastardisation, bullying, harassment, discrimination, misogyny and physical and sexual violence within the ADF. We've been told of perpetrators being protected by a code of silence and an opaque military justice process. The Defence Abuse Response Task Force, which ran from November 2012 to June 2016, shone a bright light into dark places within the ADF. It examined 2,439 complaints of abuse, bullying and harassment within Defence prior to April 2011. 1,751, or about 72 per cent of those complaints, were found to be credible and most received some compensation. The DART report, or Defence Abuse Response Task Force as it was known, should have been a wake-up call, a pivotal moment. That did not happen. It's troubling to imagine that such behaviour persists in any modern day workplace. What is even more alarming is that an employee could neglect or mishandle a complaint or misconduct or target the complainant, leaving them re-traumatised. Yet that is exactly what we're hearing. Former Air Force Chaplain Reverend Dr Nikki Coleman told us how reluctant she felt the defence hierarchy has been to act against the male colleague whom she had accused of abusing her in 2019. We heard that Dr Coleman felt the institution protected her alleged abuser to the detriment of her own career, reputation and mental health. In concluding her testimony, Dr Coleman sent a strong message to the defence leadership and I quote, you lack the moral courage to stand up to the bullies, the abusers and the sexual perverts who prey on the men and women who've signed up to protect their country and serve under you. You lie when you say you take unacceptable behaviour and more serious abuse seriously. You lie when you say that people are your most important asset." End quote. We've also heard how those who serve in the military can experience what's known as moral injury. After witnessing something that goes against their moral or ethical values, or when they feel betrayed by those whom they've served. Witness BR2, who appeared at our Brisbane hearings, spoke of recovering the bodies of asylum seekers as part of his role in the Navy. And the guilt he felt after those they managed to rescue ended up in offshore detention. We've heard evidence about the link between physical injury and poor mental health outcomes, including countless stories of sick and injured service personnel being labelled labeled malingerers and ostracised by their peers for declaring their injuries and seeking help. Seeking help early and engaging in effective treatments can lead to improved outcomes and prevent future problems. And fortunately, putting your hand up for help in the ADF is all too often seen as weakness in a male-dominated culture that reveres strength. We continue to hear evidence of the deep-rooted cultural and system-wide issues within the Department of Veteran Affairs that are impeding timely access to the support and services veterans and their families so desperately need. We've heard many stories of veterans and their families being driven to the brink, and in some tragic cases, beyond, while waiting for years for their claims to, e to be even looked at. One frustrated veteran described the situation in a submission to the Royal Commission, and I quote, there is a common saying that the paperwork hoops and hurdles you must climb over is deliberately designed to be that, that hard. Veterans will either just give up or do themselves in. Either way, the problem goes away." End quote. We note the positive impact of the recommendations contained in our interim report handed down in August last year. Government has moved quickly to harmonise complex legislation governing veterans' entitlements, and the DVA has been provided additional resources to clear the backlog of unprocessed claims. At last count, there are still just over 30,000 claims yet to be processed, but that's down from around 43,000 a year ago. We're not convinced, based on the evidence, that the level of fraud in claims justifies the often strongly adversarial approach taken by DVA in approving claims. That has to change. While it's good to see some progress being made, we're very much aware there is still a lot to do for work for DVA to, to improve its ICT and data systems, its customer service, and that adversarial culture which exists and which has left many veterans re-traumatised when forced to justify their claims for compensation. Victorian Premier Daniel Andrews told our Melbourne hearing that our servicemen and women are second-guessed by DVA when lodging claims. And I quote, 
For many veterans, there is a sense that they are not believed, that agencies that ought to be working for them are operating more like an insurance company and not an especially good insurance company. There are many ways that system can be improved and it starts with believing veterans. And that when they make claims that they are supported, not second guessed, and not treated as if they were trying to cheat the system." End quote. During our Adelaide hearings, the Secretary of DVA, Alison Frame, acknowledged she could not take away the hurt and distress that suboptimal practices within DVA had caused many veterans. But she said, and I quote, going forward, we are committed to continuing to try and improve wherever we can, end quote. We will watch this space closely as we frame up our recommendations to be included in our final report. I want to remind you that this Royal Commission is not just looking at the ADF, Defence and DVA. The scope of our inquiries covers a broad and complex landscape, including Commonwealth, State and Territory governments, oversight bodies, as well as health, ex-service and other support organisations, among others. We recognise there are roles and responsibilities for State and Territory governments in providing health services, housing, education and other services. We're heartened to see a ministerial group for State and Territory Veteran Affairs Ministers, which, although in its infancy, will examine ways to better coordinate and collaborate. This is crucial. We've also recognised the role of ex-service organisations, which is crucial also. And while there has not been effective collaboration, I'd like to acknowledge the initiative taken by ex-service organisations towards establishing a national peak body to represent and advocate for the needs of ESOs, both large and small, as well as veterans and their families. It's a good example of, of a sector not waiting for the outcome of this Royal Commission, instead listening and learning from our inquiries to date to make change, which will have positive impacts on the mental health and wellbeing of our serving and ex-serving members. Australia's defence capability primarily comes from the brave men and women who pull on the uniform of our Navy, Army and Air Force and go to work each day to protect us. Serving and ex-serving ADF members must be treated fairly with dignity and respect, with access to high quality and timely health care and strong prospects of meaningful employment once they transition out of active service. It's not hard to see that fixing the entrenched cultural and systemic issues that are impacting the mental health and well-being of members would also go a long way to solving the ADF's recruitment and retention crisis at a time when Australia is trying to bolster its uniform stocks by 30 per cent to close to 80,000 by 2040. Let's be clear, this Royal Commission does not seek to undermine our defence capability in any way. We seek to help build a more resilient, stronger and better ADF with a psychologically safe workplace to meet Australia's future defence challenges. Operationally, when we first commenced this inquiry, we did not expect to be stymied and stonewalled along the way. We have faced significant delays in the provision of vital data and information sought from defence, as well as other challenges such as cabinet and confidence, public interest immunity, and, <coughs> excuse me, and parliamentary privilege claims, and the need to sensitively gather evidence without impacting issues of national security. This Royal Commission is responding to a national crisis decades in the making. Despite the government establishing a Royal Commission and the legislature wanting certain issues investigated, obtaining critical information from Commonwealth bodies in a timely manner has been difficult. Our success will require government and its agencies, including the ADF, Defence and DVA, to once and for all get on board and act. The stark reality is that despite 57 previous inquiries over the last 20 to 30 years examining the risk factors for suicide in our military community and almost 770 recommendations arising from those inquiries, very little has actually changed. People are still dying to this day. We urge the Prime Minister, relevant ministers and the leadership of Defence and DVA to see this Royal Commission as an opportunity to drive the long overdue change that is required to ensure our brave men and women in uniform and their families have the support they need and deserve. It's important to recognise that there will be no quick fix to these issues and real, long-lasting and meaningful reforms will take time. And the focus on these issues must not end with the work of this Royal Commission. Accordingly, we commissioners believe an enduring, powerful, independent body is necessary to hold government, the ADF, Defence, DVA and other relevant agencies, as well as state and territory governments, to account to make sure that they prioritise the major, long-term and complex reforms that are needed. 
This body must not only be independent, it must have the confidence of serving and ex-serving ADF members and seek direct and significant, in significant input from them. It must be an oversight body, but not one that usurps the leadership of the DVA or ADF, nor one that absolves that leadership of its primary responsibility for veterans' wellbeing. And it must have sufficient power to deal with the issues it faces. We will release a report on this entity in the coming months and consult further with key stakeholders before finalising a recommendation to government. Bipartisan commitment is going to be required to ensure mistakes from the past do not continue. We expect strong, decisive leadership from both sides of politics as well as cross-bench MPs and senators to ensure the final recommendations of this Royal Commission are implemented and that the ADF, Defence and DVA are forevermore held to account so that the well-being of past and present members and their families remains the focus going forward. It's not enough to support and reflect on the sacrifices of our veterans only on days of commemoration and remembrance. The theme of Suicide Prevention Week this year is we all have a role to play, and nothing could be more true in relation to defence and veteran suicide. We do all have a role to play in holding government to account when it comes to ensuring the mental health and wellbeing of those who risk their lives each day in the service of our country. Voters and the media must maintain interest and demand action. That has been lacking. Every one of us has an important role to play in protecting those who protect us. Australia has let down its veterans for far too long. This Royal Commission must be a call to action. No longer can we allow the preventable deaths of our finest to be ignored. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Nick, can we just have you back at the podium for, for questions, thanks? I, <laughs> Sorry. I've, I've not done this before, so I'm not sure of the protocols, so no, no, please bear with that's, me. That's good. Yeah. Um, look, thank you very much for that. We now turn to questions from our media members, and um, but also your fellow Royal Commissioners, uh, Peggy Brown and James Douglas, who are here today, they're available to um, also chime in um, as well if, uh, to, to elaborate on your answers. Um, I'll, I'll start with the questions. And you've been critical of, of defence and defence leadership in, in this speech and, and, and comments at the Royal Commission hearings. You outlined there things like um, stonewalling on receiving data through to sort of um, too much talk, not enough action on, on responding to, to, to suicide, suicide and mental health crisis in defence. Um, you point out 57 inquiries into this issue and very little has changed. What do you put it down to, though, in among defence and defence leadership for why there hasn't been change? Is, is it culture? Is it lack of resources? Is it defence doesn't have the bandwidth to do with the various challenges it has to deal with? What, 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 what are you sort it's of... It's probably all of those things, Andrew. Um, we, we want to acknowledge that there are many, many good people, many good people in the senior leadership who are really trying hard to fix these problems. But... Um, both historically and in contemporary times, it hasn't been a huge focus. There hasn't been probably as much effort devoted to it as, it, as many other issues that probably are just as pressing in different ways. But the reality is nothing will change and nothing will improve unless there is a strong focus, that there are accountability, accountability mechanisms and that there is public reporting of the outcomes so everybody knows um, who's doing what and whether it's being done well or not. And then we hope to maintain contact with these issues and statistics and figures, and the public and the media should take more interest than they have in the past. Um, one of the reasons problems mount and fall over is when nobody's paying attention. Sometimes it's just neglect. We're all busy, you all have other things you know what you want to do, and this isn't something that you know, walks through the door for you and says, I've got a problem here, you must deal with it now. Um, that has to change. Um, and then the final point I'd make, and it's in relation to the accountability framework and, and investigation and disciplinary processes within the ADF, there are certainly issues there that appear to have been weaponised on many occasions. It appears a lot of people were punished if, or at least um, ostracised or had some sort of negative impact on their lives very unfairly. And out of the thousands of submissions we've had, the hundreds of private sessions we've had and the hundreds of public evidence that we've heard, um, there is no denying that fact. Yeah, cool. All right, I will uh, turn to our, our, our members here now. And uh, first question from Matthew Knott. 
Uh, thank you very much for the speech, Matthew Knopp, from the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. Uh, you have the uh, head of the Australian Defence Force uh, here, and I'm sure if he was up on the podium, he would say that there's no higher priority than the health and well-being of uh, the people who uh, work for the nation's military. Uh, what would you say are the things that need to be done uh, right now to improve this, because it's going to take a little while until the final uh, Royal Commission comes out? I think we've probably said that both to the leadership and others. What the Probably the biggest issue I'd, I'd want to raise at the moment is that they must all see this Royal Commission as an opportunity, not a threat, not an enemy, but a, a, a group that's been set up to genuinely try and fix these problems, arrive at solutions which must be embraced, acted on and implemented to the fullest once we finish our, our journey. Cool. Um, next question uh, from Ben Packham. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, for your speech. Um, knowing what you know now, um, would you recommend a career in defence to a potential recruit? And do you think that uh, defence will ever get on top of its recruiting challenge um, in the absence of deep reform in this regard? Um, so for the first question, I, I, I wouldn't put people off from joining, but I would be giving them, if, if it's someone related to me or, or otherwise, someone I cared about, I'd be giving them a lot of advice and I'll be hopefully monitoring as they go along to make sure that if anything does go wrong, that it's acted on appropriately and in a timely manner. Um, and the second question, do we think they're ever going to go and get on top of their recruitment um, uh, goals? I think they can, but the first step, there's probably two steps. One is a, a, a genuine recognition of the extent of the problem, the magnitude of the issues, and then the second step is actually dealing with them in a more timely and hard, hard sort of fashion. So that um, once all of those issues are sorted, I don't see any reason why people won't flock to join. That they hear these stories and, they, and no doubt they know people who they can speak to on a personal level and they hear about what's happened to some of the people um, who were treated unfairly and it, it's, it's off-putting. But there has to be a recognition of the problem and then there has to be uh, a serious dealing with the issues. How do, how do you find, um, coming out of a background with police, you know, it's probably in some similarities to defence, you know, dangerous work, very blokey environment, very stressful environment. Do you see, para have you drawn parallels there between your ex professional experience in the policing and, and, and what's happening in defence? We've had a lot of, um, we've done a lot of thinking about that and with my background I can certainly sympathise. We're both uniformed services with a highly uh, tiered and um, you, when you leave, you, it's like you feel you're leaving your tribe. After 35 or 40 years, it, it affects you, it definitely affects you. To answer your question, there are many similarities, and, but there are many differences as well. But certainly in issues of looking after people, and mental health, PTSD, and the way people are treated, which lead them to go down this dark road, the similarities are startling. It's very, very similar. We have met and spoken with the chiefs of police from around Australia and New Zealand, and we're trying to learn what lessons they have, what worked, what didn't, and just to see what may be suitable to apply to our space in the military space. But it's certainly an issue that it has to be looked at. Uh, next question, Karen Middleton. Hello, Commissioner. Thank you for your speech. Karen Middleton from the Saturday paper. I hope you'll indulge me. I have a couple of questions. Firstly, it's pretty unusual to have a Royal Commissioner address the National Press Club before their Royal Commission is completed. You've levelled a lot of criticisms today, and that's interesting. I'm wondering why you felt the need to give this address. Does it suggest people aren't listening to you? And secondly, when we in the media put questions to defence about some of the evidence at your Royal Commission, as I did recently, we get a, a fairly stock standard statement in response that says defence is very committed to addressing the tragic scourge of suicide in, in its ranks and among veterans. But if I weigh that up against the criticisms you're making about the Department of Defence, the ADF and the Department of Veterans Affairs, it suggests to me that the actions are not matching the words. Defence has a range of processes, formal processes, to ad address and in investigate matters brought before them, either events or incidents or allegations, primarily their inquiry officer inquiry reports and the Inspector General of the ADF as well. I'm wondering, given what we've heard at your Royal Commission a, a number of times and pre preceding that, about suggestions that those inquiries don't always get to the whole truth, 
It starts to look like a pattern and it reaches back two decades in my experience. I'm wondering what you think about those processes, the effectiveness of them. Are they properly designed to get to the whole truth or are they designed to be seen to be looking for it but maybe not always finding it? Um, I'll probably answer the first question first if I can remember it. <laughs> so, why, yeah. why did you yep, choose no, I got, to got come? It. <laughs> Um, we made a conscious decision to speak out at the moment because we're at a point where we feel that the issues that we've uncovered have not been noticed, absorbed, people have not been all that interested in them and one of the things that must happen for things to improve is that there must be more interest both from the public and I have to say the media on these issues and when reporting begins then people begin to notice and certainly politicians take notice as well. This is, th these are decades long in the making, these problems. We're not blaming individuals and we're not blaming anyone individually, but what happens is there's an accumulation of wrongs and then the longer it goes, the worse it gets for the individuals. We have to bring it out now. We have to talk to people about what's going to happen when this Royal Commission ceases to exist because otherwise we'll be just a 59th inquiry and there are people in this room who have accused us of that. You're just another inquiry. You're not going to achieve anything. They won't establish anything after you leave and nothing will change. And there are probably some who feel that's a good thing. We'll just sit tight, this will pass, and we'll just go on doing what we've always done. So we had to bring it all out into the open. The second question in relation to the investigative process, and I'm familiar with investigative processes, the, the thing is there are clearly issues. And if you saw the evidence last week, we delved into the Inspector General and their operations, and again, there are good people doing their best there, but, and we haven't reached any conclusions yet, so I can't tell you, yes, it's flawed and we're not happy, or this is what we think ought to happen. We're not at that point yet, but we took a lot of evidence last week that causes grave concern, including issues where families of loved ones who had had inquiries conducted into their suicide or death were not told of the outcome, and it was discovered by mistake that they hadn't, and then they've gone back and are obviously fixing it now. But there are definitely issues in that space, and it is something that affects families deeply. Thank you. Thank you. The next question from uh, Tessa Economy. Thank you very much for your time today. The backlog of veterans' claims may not be cleared by the deadline, and part of that reason is how they are categorised. Would you support changing how the backlog um, is classified, for example, only including claims in it that haven't been processed within a certain amount of time? I think the answer is yes, um, but not only is there a great deal of work going on at the moment um, in DVA, and I think a, a recognition that the problems are such that they need to be dealt with fairly quickly and promptly and, and, and efficiently, um, but there's a whole range of initiatives that have been looked at and some have commenced that I would hope will also help bring the number down. Um, more importantly, we have discussed with the Secretary who is present with us today. And, and there are moves to look at more and more digitisation or making things more electronically you know, suitable for people so they don't have to fill forms in but do things electronically, uh, perhaps even on the phone. Um, that sort of stuff is happening in other places. They are being looked at, we understand, and hopefully they'll land somewhere where they can be employed across the board to make things better. I think the, the backlog will disappear. I'm hoping as soon as possible. But there are issues apart from the backlog that DVA is trying to address at the moment. And it's the same as the ADF, it's culture. It's about how people feel they could act. It's about how people feel they can you know, do the wrong thing perhaps and not be held to account. They're the issues that will probably be harder to solve than the backlog. You, Thank you. Have you been surprised with DVA? Are, are, are there many actually former veterans working in within DVA who sort of have an understanding of these issues and perhaps uh, some, some sympathy. You talked about like the insurance, uh, uh, it's treated almost like an insurance sort of um, agent in terms of dealing with, 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 with cases and stuff like that. I mean, uh, uh, the, uh, the people in DVA have much knowledge of what's actually going on. Yep, there are many, many good people working there at the moment and achieving great results. There's also some not so good. But there is a percentage of people, and I can't remember the exact number, who are in fact veterans, and there are targets, and I understand the DVA is actually targeting recruitment from the veteran community to get them in there. In there. And one of the things we looked at in the United States of America is that a, a much larger percentage of the workforce, and in fact in the federal public service, something like a third of the workforce are veterans. That doesn't just happen now. It has to be, there has to be a strategy, there has to be a plan, and then it has to be supported from above, both from within the Defence Force and then the, the, later on from the, 
the government uh, departments to make sure that it does happen. It is a very positive thing and we'd, we'd commend it. Thank you. Uh, next question, Daniel Hurst. Daniel Hurst from Guardian Australia. Commissioner, um, the Albanese government recently knocked back a request for another extension of the inquiry's work. What would you have been able to achieve if that extension had been granted that you can't achieve with the current reporting deadline? And on a related note, you talked about the stonewalling from Defence when it came to document requests. Who do you hold responsible for that? Is it the Secretary of Defence, is it the CDF, or is it happening at a political level in the Defence Minister's office? Um, the request for an extension was made by us. We felt there were some issues we could have looked at in more depth. But we also accept that it's important for government to begin to implement major reform, and it's difficult to do that. Not impossible, but difficult to do that if we exist. We've accepted that. We, we've got a plan, and we will get the job done. Um, in terms of delays and, and the inability to access documents and so on, I, I think uh, I'm probably going to be a little bit controversial here. We're not the first Royal Commission to, to come up against these walls. Um, we have looked at other Royal Commissions and we've made inquiries about what their issues were and it's very, very similar. There is simply a, a, a bureaucracy, if you like, particularly in Canberra, but probably in the States as well. And, you know, frankly, there are a lot of legal efforts made, probably with the best intentions, but they are so strictly focused on a strictly legal aspect that things don't move as well as they should or as quickly as they should. And that's certainly been our experience. So it's not Richard Miles or Peter Dutton? No, I don't think, I'm not aware of any interference from a political level. Thank you. Yeah. Is it a, that, that failure to get documents though, is it sort of like, um, is, is it an exercise in backside covering by people or is it just a sort of bureaucratic, um, you know, goes to the culture of secrecy that it infects so much of government? I think it's probably all of that. Mm -hmm. cool. uh, next question from Melissa Code. Hi, Commissioner. Melissa Code from the Mandarin. I'd like to ask about this um, horizon body that you describe after the uh, Royal Commission wraps up, which is a recommendation for an enduring and powerful independent body which must have the confidence of serving and ex-serving service personnel. Are there comparable models you've considered that this body would uh, emulate and also what do you mean when you say powerful how do you envisage it will capture trust among this disparate ecosystem you describe of ADF defense DBA but also the state and territory jurisdictions um, the, uh, sorry what was the first part of the question again <laughs> what does powerful mean and right. other so models? powerful means I think they need Royal Commission powers um, as far as why we recommend it and what we think it ought to look like you know as, they, as the old saying goes what's the definition of a madman someone who keeps doing the same thing over and over again and expecting the result to come out differently. We can't keep doing the same thing over and over again and the suicide rate does not budge, does not shift. We have to do something different. And from all our research, what we found is that if you have a mechanism, a strong mechanism that follows up on implementing recommendations, that demands answers to certain questions, that reports publicly, sunshine being the best disinfectant, then you might get somewhere. In terms of precedence, there is a committee of experts in the United States that reports, I think it's annually, to Parliament, to their Congress, and it's an act of Congress that empowers them to do so, and the report can't be delayed or denied or, or altered by any bureaucrat or anybody else. That sort of mechanism is, is, is what we think would work. There's also another example in Victoria. The state coroner publishes, as I understand it, a quarterly report with all the inquests they've held, the recommendations made, who's responsible for them, and what they've done or haven't done. It's not rocket science. It's simply saying someone's looked at these issues. Here are things that need to be done. Who's responsible? So you have the column with the person responsible, the, the, the organisation responsible, and ask them to report on a regular basis to make sure it's finally acquitted. That hasn't happened in Australia. Do you imagine that any of the sort of stumbling blocks to access information efficiently by the Commission might be also experienced by this proposed body you recommend? Sorry, say that again. So, so some of the complaints that you had, which are very common to royal commissions, yeah. um, cabinet incompetence, public interest immunity, parliamentary privilege. Do you think there might be any challenges with this independent body in um, collating data and accessing information that the Royal Commission has also experienced? I, I mean, I'd be getting way ahead of myself, but I would expect if such a body was accepted and was established, that they would ask for powers to surmount those problems so they can do their job more effectively. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next question from uh, Leah McLennan. Uh, Leah McLennan from the ABC. 
Have you had a chance to meet with relevant ministers to discuss the issues that you've raised in your address today? And, and if yes, what sort of um, response have you been getting so far? We have met with now all of the ministers who are involved, and including the Attorney General on a couple of occasions. Um, look, the response has been positive by and large, but they also have their own restrictions um, and they have their own issues that they must address and, uh, and acquit. Um, but the reality is uh, there has been a failure in political leadership over a number of decades in, in, in anyone taking enough interest in this and making sure that things are followed up on. We did visit the United States and we noted that there is more interest in our view from the political class in these issues to do with veterans and the military. Um, to, to be fair, they have a much larger percentage of elected members who are in fact veterans in the US and it's probably just a cultural issue. Um, but there, there seem to be much more systemic, um, efficient follow-up on recommendations, demands for acquittal of all those issues. People, and nearly everyone we spoke to said they have to report regularly, go up and give evidence on the Hill, as they call it, which is Congress, about what they've done about recommendations from previous inquiries. And s a, quite a number of the people we spoke to said they were also called on regularly to brief the White House, not necessarily the President himself, but his staff. So there is a great deal of interest from the President and the Congress in the US about issues to do with following up on recommendations that affect military and veteran communities. We would hope that can be mirrored in Australia. Thank you. Thank you. On that point about the, the, what you've learned from the US, you mentioned you've gone to the other Five Eyes countries as well, partners as well, about what is... Is there anything they're doing in particular that sort of has struck you as the sort of the right approach and, and, and go, yeah, this is what we should do right now or could do in a few years sort of thing? There, there are many, many good ideas. There are probably far too many to discuss today, but the Canadians have a very good approach to helping veterans lodge an appeal against uh, claims being rejected. Um, the British have a, 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 an organisation called COPSEO, C -O -B -S -E -O, which is a true umbrella group for uh, all the ex-service organisations. It's accepted as such. It demands uh, collegiality and cooperation and collaboration, as well as governance from all the organisations. You have to register with them if you want to call yourself an ex-service organisation. So there are pockets of ideas. New Zealand has a very good idea. Um, they changed their sort of ab initio training, the initial training that they have about eight or ten years ago. Um, they're still yelling at people on the parade ground and the pack marches and all of those things. But they also have sizeable elements in the training about critical thinking, emotional intelligence, and a whole bunch of other things that help equip people, give them the tools to look after their staff. We thought there's some good ideas there as well. OK, our next question from Nick Stewart. Thanks very much for your speech. I'd like to probe into the exact location where these sort of things are occurring. Um, you, as you know, uh, uh, the military is a series of little families. There are ships. There are, there are battalions and there are squadrons. I, I was wondering what sort of differences do, do, for example, the Air Force, as I understand, have a far lower rate of this sort of thing happening? Uh, if, if so, why are there particular factors that are working to protect the Air Force, which are not um, uh, working in, in ships or in squadrons? And also, looking at it, if you have a, a cultural issue, which is within, a, say, a, bat a particular battalion, uh, you, you would expect something like that is something that, that the military could take, uh, uh, actually affect change in. But if this problem is diverse and, and permeates the entire military, um, uh, surely it's something to do with the people we're recruiting? Uh, you mentioned the difference between the reserves, for example, and, and uh, the, the, the are, are we selecting a particular group of people who may be more at risk of this sort of uh, uh, suicide or, or such ideation? Um, to answer the first question, I, I don't have clear in my head at the moment any stats that I can give you in relation to how things are better or worse in one or the other, but certainly the initial uh, impression we had is that the Air Force was somewhat lower in terms of complaints and so on. But you also have to bear in mind, there are people here who could talk about this in a far more informed way than me. It's a different environment. If you're in a submarine for two or three months, human nature being what it is, conflicts arise and so on. Um, if you're in uh, a conflict zone and you're literally living out of each other's pockets for weeks at a time, these things happen. The Air Force just have a, obviously operate in a different environment and you'd expect that to be a little bit gentler on, on, on people. 
Um, sorry, what was the second question? <laughs> uh, whether, whether or not uh, it, it's a matter of a self-selecting group. Right, yep. It's, um, we've certainly heard some evidence, particularly from the US, that even those who had some issues, perhaps mental health or otherwise, who declared that before they were selected and came in, and they helped them deal with those issues and fix whatever problems they had, the, the chances of them having problems down a track were, were, not, were not any worse than anybody else. So I, I don't think it's a problem with selecting the wrong people. I think there are issues pretty much from training onwards that contribute to those issues arising and the damage sometimes that happens to people. But we have said, and I'll, I'll say it again, that the vast majority, we think, of people who join actually have a positive experience and come out and go on to life. But there is a sizable group who have had issues which are absolutely dreadful and they must be addressed. Uh, we're going uh, back to the top of the batting order and uh, Ben Packham. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Ben Packham from The Australian again. Um, you talk about that long list of uh, past inquiries and, um, and, and the impediments to change, uh, culture, lack of political will, I guess money as well would also be one. Um, do you fear a situation where um, the Albanese government um, uh, doesn't uh, stump up the, uh, the money, the investment needed uh, for the sort of deep reform that you are calling for? And I guess what is your message to the government on that front? Um, I guess my message, and we delivered it in fact very recently, is they must see this Royal Commission as a call to action. They must see this as an opportunity, not a threat. We're not an enemy. We're trying to help the ADF be, be a, a better organisation in terms of resilience, caring after people, giving them the, the ideas that they need, hopefully, to implement to make all of that happen. Um, I, I'd, I would be disappointed if the recommendations that come out of this Royal Commission simply form the 58th inquiry and are filed. We're the first Royal Commission, and many people have pointed that out to us, and they've said there is great expectation, and we feel the weight of history following on all those other inquiries where not enough was achieved, um, we have to make sure that, as I said, you can't keep doing the same thing and expecting the result to come out different. We've got to do something different. And for us, having an entity that monitors this space, reports publicly, raises awareness in the community, in the media, um, in the public, it, it's got to be a better way of doing it. Yeah. Uh, back to uh, Karen Middleton. Hello, Commissioner Karen Middleton again. Um, you handed down an interim report last year, and one of the recommendations was seeking something to address uh, what you, I think, described as the legal obstacles that prevent a Royal Commission from receiving evidence or information that's been presented to a parliament. It's something we hear regularly relating to quasi-judicial bodies. That's either evidence to a committee or given in the chambers or in a report that's tabled in the parliament. And I'm wondering, is that part of the reason we do keep seeing inquiry after inquiry because they have to keep reinvestigating the same thing? They can't use some of the evidence that's been presented like that before. Have you raised that directly with the government separately from it being in your report? What do they say? Is there any appetite for what would be quite a significant legal change to allow a Royal Commission like yours to access information that's already been gathered? I think the short answer, answer is it's being considered, but we don't have a definitive no or a definitive yes yet. Um, but if I could just raise one example. About three or four years ago, the, uh, uh, the National Audit Office um, did a report on uh, whether the defence generally have followed up and complied with recommendations from previous inquiries. And he had some criticism. He found them wanting. That report is significant for us. It's nothing to do with suicide, but it discusses whether defence generally have been following up on inquiries, and it would have been a good point of discussion for us with them. That report was published on his website, uh, and it was, I think there may have been a press conference, and it was discussed widely. Probably thousands of people have seen it. But it was tabled in Parliament. Therefore, it attracts parliamentary privilege. Therefore, and it is accurate, the Commonwealth argued that you can't use it, rely on it, question anyone about it. Um, you, you, you have to find a long way around to ask questions about it uh, because it has parliamentary privilege, because it's been tabled in Parliament. Now, I'm not a lawyer, and I don't know whether my colleague James Douglas may want to add to what I'm about to say, but it just seems to me as a layman, this isn't a satisfactory situation for inquiries that have been commissioned by the government to look at serious issues. James, would you like to add anything? This is James Douglas, my fellow commissioner and a former Supreme Court judge from Queensland, who knows a lot more than me about legal stuff. <laughs> it is a, an issue which we've raised with the attorney 
And to use Nick's example, for example, we might be able to receive that report into evidence, but we can't draw any inferences from it, and we wouldn't really be able to cross-examine witnesses about it or see where it had gone. So it's, from our point of view, a significant issue, but we are still talking about it. We have been talking about it. Thank you. I, I would just add that we are not the first Royal Commission to raise these issues formally and otherwise, and I understand the Australian Law Reform Commission has also commented on this and saying it needs to change. Thank you. Uh, next question, Daniel Hurst. Daniel Hurst from The Guardian again. Just on a potential structural issue, uh, do you believe the Department of Veterans Affairs has been over-reliant on external labour, and to what extent do they need to rebuild their internal uh, capability and workforce? Um, I, I don't think they had any choice. Um, there was a staffing cap brought in, as I understand it, by the Abbott government, and the work did not stop. Uh, it simply escalated. The, number, the demand for, um, for services went through the roof. Um, the answer, the only answer available, I think, at the time, was to revert to labour hire. But I also understand, and I won't speak for the department, but I understand they are consciously moving away from that to full-time staff, and there has been an injection of 500 people uh, coming or have come already on, book, on the books as permanent employees to address that issue. But I agree with your proposition. It's not good to have temporary staff who are not invested in the work or the clientele or the agency. Our yeah, final question for today from uh, Maurice Riley, the club's uh, chief executive. Thanks, Andrew, and thank you, Commissioner, for being here today. Uh, mine's a sort of a broader question on media reporting about suicide. Is, does, is your inquiry, is you looking into how media reports on suicide, and should there be a differentiation between the area that you're looking in versus uh, civilian suicides? Is there, is there a question there for... Australian Press Council or others to perhaps uh, review the way in which we report uh, suicide, you know, balancing out the public interest? Um, I, I think they should all be treated in the same way, and perhaps I, I could ask my uh, fellow Commissioner Peggy to comment on it, but before she does, I just... The Canadians have published guidelines in a little booklet that the media use which actually address the issue of how to report on military suicides. Um, there has to be some sensitivity attached, and from a previous life I know, there are guidelines, and the media, by and large, with some exceptions, ab abide by the sort of accepted rules in terms of doing the right thing and not causing harm by publishing details of how and whatever that you wouldn't want um, to, to be out there that may actually upset someone or cause them to emulate it in some way. But, so there are frameworks in place, but it's, it could always be improved. I don't think it needs to be differentiated between military and the civilians. But Dr. Peggy Brown, would you like to say anything? No. You've been put on the spot. <laughs> I, have, I don't really have anything to um, offer in addition to that. I think Nick's absolutely correct in terms of reporting about suicide. Um, veteran suicide, in that sense, should be uh, treated the same as the rest of the population. I think what we do need to stress, however, is that we shouldn't be stigmatising um, veterans by, by singling them out in a way. Um, I mean, it's important that the issue is recognised, but each individual account, um, potentially how it, how it is dealt with and reported in the media can either add to the stigma or the sense that all veterans are broken, or it can um, help to, to kind of normalise it, in, in, not in you know, normalising suicide, but in terms of seeing veterans as part of a, a broader cohort of vulnerable um, individuals who uh, ultimately take their own lives. I knew she would add something much more valuable than what I said. So. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And I think just a reminder again um, for current and former personnel and their families, you can contact Open Arms on 1800 011 046 or Lifeline on 131 114. Please, everyone, thank you very much for Nick Aldis for today's address. Thanks very much. <laughs>